Thank you, Mr. Just for that wonderful talk. Our next speaker, Mr. Donovan Urban, is also a distinguished doctoral candidate at Purdue University, pursuing the interdisciplinary study of philosophy and theater. Mr. Urban received his bachelor's degree in philosophy from Frostburg State University in 2007 and his master's in philosophy from Westchester University of Pennsylvania in 2009. Mr. Urban's areas of interest and expertise are wide ranging, including ontology, phenomenology, and existential philosophy, hermeneutics, philosophy and literature, and literary modernism, and logic, ethics, and the history of philosophy, both ancient and modern. Mr. Urban is a member of both the Sigma Tau Delta and Pi Sigma Tau International Honor Societies, received the Claghorn Award from the Department of Philosophy while at Westchester University, and was awarded the Partner University Fund Scholarship to attend the theoretical seminar at the University of Paris in 2014. Not only does Mr. Urban study literature, but he is also a successful novelist who has published two novels, Things in Brown Paper and Two Days of Dying, as well as a theoretical work, The Ontological Art and Other Essays. Along with a wealth of teaching experience at various colleges, Mr. Urban has successfully organized numerous academic lecture series, seminars, and conferences, such as Purdue University's Philosophy and Literature Program's Illumination Lecture Series. We are so thrilled to welcome to Barrett yet another example of the kind of brilliance and achievement one desires as an undergraduate student seeking a master's or doctoral degree in the near future. Mr. Urban is truly an exemplary student and academic whose study and concern benefits all those who hope to follow in his footsteps. His talk today is titled, Weathering Thought, The Exposure of Being and Robert Measles, The Man Without Qualities. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Urban. Thank you so much uh, for that um, wonderful introduction and thank you for your talk. Um, Sturgis. I don't know how I'm going to follow it, <laughs> but I'll do my very best. <laughs> um, so I want to thank Dr. Ramsey for the invitation to speak today and all of you here in attendance for coming to listen. The reputation of Barrett precedes it, and so I'd like to take this opportunity to challenge all of you here to the task of thought. I myself uh, almost certainly will not be thinking this afternoon. <laughs> I will talk dumbly for a while, um, repeating something that has been written ahead of time in preparation for this event. This event, this lecture, is dedicated to the challenge of thinking. Thinking can begin in many ways, but one of the things that prepares us for thought is listening. In this respect, you are much better situated than I because you are listening. We tune in to listen. There is an attunement of our attention and an intentional direction of our perception toward the spoken word in an effort of understanding. It is an interpretive understanding, as you must necessarily interpret the string of sound issuing from my mouth, and through this interpretive act of understanding, render the sounds sensible. The sensibility of the sound is that for which <coughs> you listen, you get the sense of it. <coughs> Therefore, we will need something to listen to. I will speak words, but surely not any words will do as a preparation for thought. Thinking must be about something. And I worry that if I take up thought itself as the theme, then the thinking about thinking that would result, the self-reflective entanglement and the thinking of thought itself, will lead us headlong down the wrong path into a thing that cannot be thought, that is not thought. And so you would not be thinking which is exactly what I've challenged us to do. <laughs> so, to what will we listen? Let us listen to literature. I will let literature guide my words. As I have said, I will read dumbly what has been written beforehand. I will be guided by the words of Robert Musil, written in his great work of modernist literature, Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften, in English, The Man Without Qualities. Before I begin a proper interpretation, I think some background on Musil himself will be in order. He was born at the end of 1880 in the Austro-Hungarian town of Klagenfurt in the south central part of modern Austria, just north of Slovenia. He was a precocious youngster, and he became sufficiently delinquent that his family sent him to military school, first in Eisenstadt and then in Hranis, over 300 miles away, in what would soon become Czechoslovakia and then the Czech Republic. 
So these early uh, travels across Austria-Hungary give a sense of the scope of Musil's vision, uh, vision and also his attempt to grapple with the meaning of the empire's collapse after the First World War. His experience at adolescence in a military academy forms the basis of his expressionistic first novel, um, Die Verrungen des Zodlings Churlis, often translated simply as Young Churlis. It's a coming-of-age novel, typical of the German Bildungsroman. However, the sympathetic portrayal of homosexuality, as well as the use of sadomasochistic elements as a foil for the exploration of implicitly political um, power arrangements can be seen as an innovation within that genre. It also signifies the beginning for Musil of an aesthetic life spent attempting to grapple with the dissolution of meaning and the traumatic upheaval of moral and cultural norms uh, evidenced by the destruction of Austria-Hungary at the end of World War I. At first, Musil was a university student of mechanical engineering, and they even invented a device for the continuous mixture of colors via spinning plates, the Musil Schorfard Kreisel. But he became restless and dissatisfied with engineering, beginning a new phase of PhD studies in psychology and philosophy under the renowned professor Karl Stumpf at the University of Berlin. In 1906, Musil published Jung Churlis, and soon thereafter refused a professorship at the University of Graz in order to focus on writing. The war disrupted all life in the empire, Musil's included, and he joined the uh, army in 1916. After the collapse of the empire, Musil retired to the writing life in Vienna, often poor, in debt, and dependent on friends to make ends meet. He was notoriously jealous of the success of other writers, and yet held in high regard as an artist among artists by his fellows. He spent 10 years writing and drafting the first volume of his magnum opus, The Man Without Qualities, and published the 1,072-page first volume in 1930. I want to begin there, at the beginning of The Man Without Qualities. Although we recognize it today as a modernist novel, Musil himself proclaimed his fiction writing to be a form of essay. In an essay, according to Musil, the writer pushes forward into uncharted and unknown places. The theme is their guide, and the essay form is often exploratory, sometimes episodic, and occasionally has the appearance of fracture, of incongruity, or incompleteness. Not surprising, then, that The Man Without Qualities is an essayistic novel without an end. Musil never completed it in his lifetime. The second volume was published in 1933, but World War II disrupted Musil's productivity, sending he and his Jewish wife into exile in 1938. The author spent the rest of his life in Switzerland, where he died at the age of 61 while still drafting the third volume of The Man Without Qualities. In 1943, uh, rather, Musil's widow Martha published his final attempts to finish the novel, some of which were notes, fragmentary and suggestive of the novel's ultimate direction. The beginning of the novel already contains this precariousness, this sense of imminent disillusion and transience. It begins with a descriptive account of the weather. Musil writes, quote, a barometric low hung over the Atlantic. It moved eastward toward a high pressure zone over Russia without as yet showing any inclination to bypass this high in a northerly direction. The isotherms and isotheres were functioning as they should. The air temperature, like monthly fluctuations of the temperature, the rising and setting of the sun, the moon, the phases of the moon, of Venus, of the rings of Saturn, and the many other significant phenomena were all in accordance with the forecasts in the astronomical <laughs> yearbooks. The water vapor in the air was at its maximal state of tension, while the humidity was minimal, in a word that characterizes the facts fairly accurately, even if it is a bit old-fashioned. It was a fine day in August. <laughs> <He's so good. laughs> First, notice the technical nature of this description, but do not be seduced by it, as if it were the technical alone that should guide our interpretation. For although the paragraph rings out with a technical meteorological sound, it is at the same time tinged with a sense of excess, as if at some point the facts, as they are so characterized, cannot come fully to articulate the scene, no matter how volu uh, voluminously we pile on descriptive language. Not only are the basic atmospheric conditions outlined, but also the rising and the setting of the sun, the moon, the phases of the moon, of Venus, the rings of Saturn, and many other phenomena. So it is not just the immediate conditions of one particular place, 
but also conditions that telescope out beyond the world into vast expanses and magnitudes beyond the scope of this one fine day in August. There are many more significant phenomena, he says, too many more to be elaborated, perhaps, and yet, in this inability to account for all of the possible facts, we do not negate, uh, we do not negate or erase their significance. In fact, Musil seems to be suggesting that the simple phrase, it was a fine day in August 1913, captures the richness and significance of all the technically elaborate details provided in the entire preceding paragraph. This is Musil's methodological insight, that there is always so much to say, and yet there is only so much that can be said. Thus, although the technical account may appear superior in its minutia, the same phenomena and state of affairs is equally expressed in the far simpler statement that it is indeed a fine August day. And yet, this is not to deny the complexity of the, of the event, nor is it to degrade the value of technicalities. It is, rather, to open us up to the full richness of poetic language and poetic thinking. But we're just getting started. We're only at the very beginning of Musil's novel, only at the very beginning of this invitation to thought, only just now starting our attempt at thinking. Just as we should not get sidetracked and overly invested in the language of meteorological technicalities, neither should we now become too enamored by poetic language itself. The task of thinking, rather, requires that we train our ears to listen for the truth in whatever form it happens to appear. Not every mode of expression is suited for every truth, and some modes better reveal certain truths than others. There was perhaps never more sage advice in all the history of philosophy than that given by Aristotle at the end of book two of his Metaphysics. Therein, Aristotle teaches us, quote, one must be already trained to know how to take each sort of argument, since it is absurd to seek at the same time knowledge and the way of attaining knowledge, and neither is easy to get. Thus, we must be wary and careful to differentiate the way in which Musil's text can expose us to an ontological insight from the insight itself, that to which we are exposed in thought. Before I had mentioned Musil's conception of his own work as being essayistic, from the outset, where the weather is our entry into the whole of the text, we can see that Musil is presenting us with an essayistic muriology. In formal logic, muriology is the study of parthood relations, that is, the relation of parts to the whole and also of parts to other parts within the whole. In the opening paragraph, Musil presents us with a set of part relations which are intended to represent the whole where the whole is represented as it was a fine day in August 1913. Soon, however, Musil's view takes us down layer by layer to the scene of a traffic accident that has occurred in the city of Vienna. The opening paragraph sets us off on a course that begins from on high in the atmosphere, where forces cosmic and global have come into conjunction to produce a fine August day. It should be noted on the technical side that precise knowledge of the cosmic conditions, the alignments of the planet, and so on, would even allow us to determine that this fine day was indeed in August 1913. We would only need to consult an astronomical calendar. Nevertheless, it is clear that the weather pattern is not the whole. Musil does not mean us to understand that this particular relation of parts is all that is. Somehow, this part of parts is illustrative of a deeper ontological insight. The weather is exemplary for Musil. This part of parts reflects for us the structure of being itself. Here we must take a preliminary account of what we mean by being itself. I want us to attempt to think being as the very ground of parts and wholes themselves. Uh, we can go pretty far with this preliminarily uh, Kantian view of being, not as predicating the existence of something, not just saying there is something, right? but rather as itself the very condition of the possibility of anything whatsoever. Uh, a hasty articulation, perhaps, but one necessarily uh, to facilitate our attempt at thinking through Musil's text, no matter how insufficient it may be in capturing the fullness of being itself. Thus, if we understand being in this way, we begin to see that Musil's approach is one taken by way of synecdoche. In a synecdoche, a part of something is used as a metaphorical stand-in for the whole of the thing, or vice versa. 
Um, students of rhetoric will note that Kenneth Burke held synecdoche to be one of four master tropes because of their role in the discovery and description of truth. Um, in Musil, the trope is applied in order to expose ontological truth. With a clear August day, Musil has cleared a way for us to approach being. It is not a coincidence, a coincidence that Musil moves from weather to the traffic. Both weather and traffic could stand in for one another. They are systems of part relations wherein tangential forces collide and produce a singular event, whether it be one fine day in August 1913 or a traffic accident involving a truck and a pedestrian on a specific street in the city of Vienna. The day's weather and the day's traffic are, each in their own way, singular events that emerge from the collusion of an innumerable set of variables all coming into concert. They will each dissipate their various parts and patterns moving away from the former whole and entering into new relations with new parts to generate new events, new holes, and different days with their own weather and traffic that will be both like and unlike those of previous days and days yet to come. One of the innovations of Musil's vision of being lies in its systematicity. But it is systematic in a way that is totally different from Kant's architectonics or Hegel's ascent through reason to absolute spirit in the end of history. Musil, rather, presents a vision of systematic multiplicity. In this understanding, the world does indeed express a kind of systematic structure. This is contrary to the majority of analytic philosophy in the Anglo-American world, where systematic philosophy is eschewed for the minute analysis of isolated problems according to the representational schema of propositional logic. Indeed, Musil's text suggests, and I think Aristotle's advice seconds this suggestion, that this type of analysis is not fit for the task of ontology. Rather, we need a more inclusive vision one that encompasses both the technical language of the meteorological sciences as well as the poetic potential of fine days in August. A vision suited to explain the emergence of systems from the confluence of forces, and yet also acknowledges and maintains the transitory nature of these systems, abstaining from the reification of any given system into an absolute totality that pretends to encompass everything. Thus, the movement from weather to the traffic should not disturb us, for both are parts of a whole in relation to one another, while simultaneously expressing wholes that are themselves capable of reflecting structures of being. Musil uses synecdoche in both its macro and microscopic potential, offering us a glimpse of the whole through the part and giving us a whole by which each part is rendered sensible. This interplay is facilitated by the openness of Musil systems. They are never closed. They are open, transitory, and feed into and out of one another. These are dynamic systems. Like myriology, dynamic systems have a rigorous theoretical basis in mathematical logic. The theoretical applications of dynamical systems analysis is to trace the continuous development of a complex system from one physical state to another. So how does the system move from state A to state B in a smooth, continual movement? Um, students of calculus will no doubt suspect the importance of differential equations to these theoretical uh, concerns, but our primary focus must be the emphasis that dynamic systems place on time. Time is of the essence for us. Musil has serendipitously brought forth the metaphysical bugbear of time through a revolutionary formulation of the age-old philosophical problem, the problem of change, of becoming, of motion between states. Time was subtly indicated in the beginning, where Musil makes sure we know the year. It was August 1913, and so time is evoked through the acknowledgement of the historical record. Uh, remember, volume one of The Man Without Qualities was published in 1930, and so audiences of the time and we as contemporary readers are fully aware that the Austro-Hungarian Empire was doomed, that the Great War meant the final defeat and dissolution of the empire into many smaller nation states. This is crucial to the understanding of being introduced through the weather of the fine August day. The main narrative of the novel involves the planning of a great celebration of the 70th year of the reign of Emperor Franz Josef I. Anyone who has planned an event involving a significant number of people, uh, for instance the TEDx talks hosted here earlier this week or even these present lectures, understand immediately the seemingly innumerable quantity of variables that arise in conjunction and contribute to the final form, shape, atmosphere, and quality of the event itself, in just the same manner as a fine day in August or a traffic jam in 
Vienna. If you can, project the difficulties and challenges involved in planning these smaller events into the great magnitude of a year-long imperial jubilee, and you'll get a sense of the scope of Musil's novel, and also of its irony. A great event will never happen. Or rather, it's happening far outstrips the effort of any one character's attempt to control and guide the event. And finally, realized historical moment is something no one could have ever foreseen. Each contributes in their own way, according to their own talents, attempting to shape the event into the object they desire. Some objectives are achieved, some are thwarted. The theme of a year of Austria is realized through the stroke of an unnamed journalist pen, but the characters involved in the planning seize upon this idea, appropriate it, attempt to make it their own, and use it as the instrument for the achievement of their own ends. They are, themselves, wholes of parts within the whole, the wholes they are but parts within a greater whole, itself a part of the European whole, itself a part of parts in the whole of the world, and so on. In this muriology, Musil expresses a dynamic vision of open, interconnected systems involved in an ongoing process of mutual formation, confluence, and eventual, eventual dissipation. This is the thinking that must be weathered in our attempts to expose being, which is the task of philosophy broadly construed. We cannot control this thinking, but neither does thought control us. Indeed, the concept of control is one entirely inappropriate to the task of thinking. This is why I, myself, am, uh, am ill-suited for thought as I stand here and read these words, prepared ahead of time for you. And you, listening as you are to these words, are far better situated to think than I. I, in commanding these written words, have abandoned thought. Why? Let me end, as I began, with the words of Robert Musil. He gives us a glimpse of what it might mean to think. He writes that thinking, and I will quote at length, comes about not very differently from a dog with a stick in its mouth trying to get through a narrow door. <laughs> he will turn his head left and right until the stick slips through. We do much the same thing, but with the difference that we don't make indiscriminate attempts but already know from experience approximately how it's done. The slipping through takes the clever fellow just as much by surprise as it does the dim fellow. It is suddenly there, and one perceptibly feels slightly disconcerted because one's ideas seem to have come of their own accord instead of waiting for their creator. This disconcerting feeling is nowadays called intuition by many people who would formerly have called it inspiration but it is only something impersonal, namely the affinity and coherence of the things themselves meeting inside a head." End quote. This something impersonal is the event of thought. It has the structure of the weather, a traffic jam, a grand jubilee. It is the dynamical confluence and mutual dependence of very many heretofore unforeseen variables coming together in the human being who has prepared a place for thought. There, in being human, is the place for the occurrence of thought. But it is not the human being who thinks. Rather, it would almost be better to say that it is the human being who is thought. We are the occasion of the thinking of thought, but only for a time, in between states A and B, and then it is gone again. To think is to dwell in this in-between, to be in transit, to move, to come to be and then pass away, each thinking of bringing into being what is thought before it sinks again into non-being or is made concrete in the deed. We, when we heed Aristotle's advice and we have trained ourselves to hear the truth appropriate to each way of approaching being, then our presence in this process of thinking becomes less and less evident. As Musil puts it, quote, as long as the process of thinking is in motion, it is quite a wretched state, as if all the brain's convolutions were suffering from colic. And when it is finished, it, is no long, it no longer has the form of the thinking process as one experiences it, but already that of what has been thought, which is regrettably impersonal. For the thought then faces outward and is dressed for communication to the world. When a man is in the process of thinking, there is no way to catch the moment between the personal and the impersonal. 
And this is manifestly why thinking is such an embarrassment for writers that they gladly avoid it. I, I have to confess, I, I avoided talking about thinking for so long exactly to circumvent this embarrassment. Um, and that is why I have led us so circumspectively to think being through the traffic of a fine August day. Meriology, dynamical systems, the weather, traffic, a jubilee, these are but the turning of the stick as we try to pass through the door of thought. And although we may pass the threshold alone, we are led to the door by the others with whom we commune and are met again by them on the other side of thought. After all, Musil has it that at the end of the process of thinking, we arrive at a thought facing outward, dressed for communication to the world. Thus, the solitude of thought rests upon the solidarity of meaning and a language that is shared. What we learn from our exposure to being in this way is the instability of ourselves in the act of thought, which is to say, the fundamental instability of our being as we oscillate between ourselves and the world, between ourselves and the others with whom we share the world, and with the other who is ourself on either side of thinking. To expose ourselves to the thinking of being is to expose ourselves to the possibility of an ethical relation, not only to other people, but also to the world, and as Paul Ricoeur has said, to oneself as another. Musil himself sees this oscillation, putting it simply and elegant, elegantly that if thinking is not a personal affair, then it is, quote, world in and world out, aspects of world falling into place inside a head. This oscillation occasionally has the appearance of conflict or contradiction. Musil goes on to observe, quote, the well-known ability of thought to dissolve and dispel those deep, raging, morbidly tangled and matted conflicts generated in the dank regions of the self apparently rests on nothing other than its social and worldly nature, which links the individual creature to other people and objects. Unfortunately, this healing power of thought seems to be the same faculty that diminishes the personal sense of experience. However, this relation is only unfortunate for egoists and opportunists, and is completely unknown to the narcissist. In reality, this relation is all of life, and is the very basis of it. It brings us back again to our home and to ourselves, where we might be able to hear at last and listen to the old Nguni Bantu proverb, I am because we are, which was expressed by the philosopher Albert Camus when he wrote, at this limit the we are, le nous sommes, paradoxically defines a new form of individualism. As the African thinker and scholar Michael Onyebu Keseze has written, humanity is a quality we owe to each other. We create each other and need to sustain this otherness creation. And if we belong to each other, we participate in our creations. We are because you are, and since you are, definitely I am. The I am is not a rigid subject, but a dynamic self-constitution dependent on this otherness creation of relation and distance. This is the ontological insight to which Musil's text has cleared the way, the deep and ineluctable interconnectivity between ourselves, the world, and the other. We must weather this thinking of being, let it wash over us, and be carried away by it. Thank you.